Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started promptly here at five o'clock, uh, eight o'clock Eastern. I just first want to thank everybody for taking the time tonight um, out of a uh, you know, busy night. And for those joining us from the US, Thanksgiving starting tomorrow. Uh, thanks for taking the time to join us. Really appreciate it. So I'm James Waller, the International Executive Director of Thrive. Uh, three years ago, I left the daily operation of my businesses, uh, completely compelled to come join the Thrive team and the impact that they're having and the ability to scale the work. Um, I've been ex so excited ever since. So tonight, we're going to hear stories from uh, some of the climbers that were on the trip, as well as regarding the climb of the world's largest uh, freestanding mountain, Kilimanjaro. We're going to see a short video about uh, some of the community impact uh, that Thrive is having. And then lastly, we'll have an opportunity uh, to, to um, talk about the impact for next year that Thrive is gonna have. Last time I hosted a gala was actually two years ago and uh, there was about 115 people that joined and it was just so different being able to be in a foyer and meet dozens of people, great conversations. I'll tell you, it was a lot different though, trying to stay focused while giving the keynote and somebody in the front row drops uh, a wine glass right in front of you. Uh, a lot different than on Zoom uh, doing a webinar, but uh, such a great opportunity. So let's talk about uh, Kilimanjaro and the climb and the campaign that we've been doing the last couple of months. The original idea actually began three years ago when our found founder, Dale Bolton, he made the transition from running the organization the last 10 years uh, to stepping into more of a founder role. Dale wanted to go on a learning curve. When I talked to him, he said, yeah, it's about uh, you know, a learning curve, wanting to know more about overcoming, about challenges, about experiencing community, experiencing teamwork, a lot of things that the communities we work in go through and they experience. So Dale wanted to do this in combination with this year raising funds for Thrive to create an awareness for the work that we're doing. And so this kind of snowballed into quite a large fundraising event, a team of six going out and actually climbing Kilimanjaro in September, as well as popped out of this was doing a documentary about the climb and uh, about the experience. We're planning on launching the documentary early next year. So tonight we've got a sneak peek of a trailer and um, actually we're gonna go ahead and we'll take a look at that right now. There's this kind of parallel thing happening where uh, this crazy big mountain uh, that I've been looking at for 15 years and then we have this crazy thing of wanting to uh, change the lives of 5,000 uh, communities. You have to pour every bit of who you are into this if you're going to make it to the top. Oh, oh thank you. That was like totally adrenaline, man. Sometimes you're so absorbed in your own just, you know, pain and exhaustion and remembering that you can fail and being grateful for uh, each day and each step. with a lot of energy, but as we go, the higher we go, the tougher it becomes. That's awesome. So exciting and so good to see just uh, even the experience that the, the team had. With that, we actually want to invite and we want to talk to two of our climbers, um, both Joyce and Ambrose. They're actually joining us from Katale, Kenya, which is about 400 kilometers west of Nairobi. Um, it is just after four in the morning for them. Uh, so it's a huge privilege that they're joining us here uh, tonight slash their morning. Um, Ambrose Mochian, he's our executive director in Kenya. I've known him for about three years and honestly, Ambrose is unbelievably loyal. He's a good friend. He's diligent. I'm just, I feel incredibly blessed to be able to work alongside of him. And then Joyce, Joyce, she's our training coordinator 
in uh, Katawe. She's one of the most resilient, strong, di uh, diligent women that I know. Um, actually, <laughs> my first and only ever African wedding that I've ever attended was with Joyce and her husband, Jacob, um, when they invited me. This is where I actually realized for the life of me, I cannot dance, but I do have proof of it. Oh, I promised my wife I wouldn't show that video ever again. So with that, Ambrose, I want to go ahead and I want to invite both of you. And Ambrose, I want to ask you the first question. Why would you ever want to do such a difficult thing like this in climbing Kilimanjaro? Make sure and go ahead and turn it off mute. Yep. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, thank you, James, for giving this opportunity uh, to start. As you said, a friend for three Yes, I don't see you like my boss, but a friend and a brother, the same thing with Dev. And uh, uh, just to start with, uh, as you said, three years ago, uh, Dev approached me and asked me, would you like to climb one of the mountains? Have you ever climbed Mount Kilimanjaro? And I told him, I've never. And uh, I was one day, one time, he said, one day, one time, we'll climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And uh, I really know when was that. And unfortunately, uh, the issue of uh, uh, the pandemic that is COVID came and uh, we started planning uh, and he said, okay, we'll start planning this. And if I don't make it because of uh, COVID restrictions, you will go there and you will represent Thrive. And I was like, how can I do this alone? And I said, okay, uh, I'll do it because one thing I see, whatever I'm doing, it's a call. And uh, it was a tedious work, but when I remembered why I was doing this, my sacrifice away from the family, that uh, hard work, remembering that whatever I was doing was coming to change a life, a community in the world. I felt that it was the right thing to do as the executive uh, or the, uh, the CEO of uh, Drive here in Kenya and also in Africa. And I wanted to show people that through sacrifice, coming up together and doing this because of the people, it's a good thing. So, and that's what uh, gave me that morale of doing and climbing the mountain, which I think for me, it was tiresome. It was not just like Alicia but also it was great time to reflect the 12 years that I've been with Drive, doing different things, working with different communities, different people. So it was awesome. And uh, I think uh, I'll be sharing more on how it was. So thank you, James. Yeah, no, you bet. I appreciate that. Joyce, what about you? Um, why would you, in the beginning when we, you were asked about this, why, we, why did you want to do such a difficult thing as climbing Kilimanjaro? Oh, hello, everybody. Hope you can be able to hear me very well. Yeah, on my side, uh, like what I met when I reached Kilimanjaro is not what I expected. I never thought that it would be such a very hard task, but I had a determination like I'll make it. And I was having this word in my, in my heart that every journey starts with a step. So wherever we reached there and we started having our first uh, trip, our, our first distance that we were, we were supposed to cover on that day, it seemed very simple and a walk in the park. But as we continued walking, it, it started becoming tougher. So the remaining like, uh, let's say 500 meters, it wasn't easy. Everybody was like, ah, are we going to reach? You can see the camp is over there, but we cannot be able to reach it. But I really had that determination and I, I was like, every journey starts with a step. And I know since this is going to impact very many lives and it's, it's my passion to see people being impacted as a try for good. And it really make me keep going and really being focused. And I also saw the way porters were really 
moving very fast and they were carrying heavy loads on their neck, on their head. So I felt like, ah, I'm only carrying 10 kgs. I can really make it. Though I was the only lady in our crew or in our team, but the guys really encouraged me and it was really nice on my side. Back Joyce, to you, Jim. Was there ever a moment you didn't think you were going to go to the top? What was that like? Um, I All the time I was like, ah, I can make it. And let me make you laugh. I, I was like looking at Mr. Dale and Mr. John and they was like, if this old man can do it, even me I can do it. <laughs> awesome. Because like my age is, is like <laughs> people their age. Joyce, that is awesome. Yeah. Oh, I hear you. Are you, um, Ambrose, in a few sentences, I know you've, uh, you've shared a little bit, but maybe in a few sentences or even keywords, describe mm -hmm. the overall the experience for you. Uh, I can say uh, it was great. And uh, as you said, it was a great moment. Also, I think that was the first time that I had good time with my kaka. Kaka means brother, Dale together, uh, climbing. And if you see on all the footage, I was just behind him. And I was just saying, guys, uh, I need to be behind you so that if anything happens, I'll be responsible because you are in my continent. You are my like my father and uh, my boss. So I was just behind him and going, taking the earpiece. I, I also became an old man like them. So that's why I was just behind them. And that really, that, that really helped me because you see my pace, I was going a pace of old people, not young people. So that's why always I was strong and uh, it was great. That's awesome. Joyce, uh, last question for you. Can you tell us just briefly your role at Thrive as the training coordinator, what you do in Oversee, and then can you connect that to your passions and what you're passionate about and uh, connecting it to what you do at Thrive? Yeah, my role in Thrive for Good is a training coordinator. And I really have a passion in training and teaching people. So wherever I go, uh, I learn something new. And from, from what I learn, I make it spread to many people or to others. So like for this case, when I went to Kilimanjaro, I really learned a lot of things like the way people like from the porters, the way they were sending themselves, the way they were committed on what they were doing, it really made me, it really meant me to, to have a lesson that in every opportunity that you get, you really need to offer yourself to your level best and you really need to deliver the right way. So uh, the lesson there that I can give to others is that any opportunity that you get, you have to utilize it and you have to be really focused on what you have and hold it tightly and make sure that you deliver to your level best. That's awesome. You can see where Joyce, you know, leading up, out, you know, all of our training and being the training coordinator every moment. Joyce, I, 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 I've learned many times that you've spoken, you know, words and have been powerful, you know, and concise learning from you. Um, thank you so much. It's awesome. Ambrose, on your end, maybe, uh, when, you know, knowing your role, your passions, you, you know, and you've been with Thrive for over 12 years, you know, and talking about, you know, your passions for what you do. Uh, thank you, James. And uh, as you have said, for the last 12 years, I worked with Thrive and I just started as a field staff whereby I was working with my community and different communities, then became the training coordinator and, and now the executive uh, and our the chief executive officer. And one of the things that I love or my passion is serving people. And uh, for some of you might have heard my story that uh, I was to become like a priest. And uh, one of the things that came, the voice of God said, you can serve me even outside priesthood and whatever I'm doing here at Drive, that's my passion. Uh, I'm meeting people, helping people, uh, 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 mingling with people and trying to see that at least they have changed their lives. And that's my passion. And I feel happy when I see stories of people that we have touched with what we are doing. 
uh, as a team. So I feel very good. And I said, God, uh, one, you have uh, fulfilled your word that you said, you'll serve me even outside priesthood. And for me, being in this position and whatever I'm doing, I see it as a call, not a job. And that's why I do it with my heart, knowing that I'm going to touch so many people. Thank you, James. Uh, Ambrose, that is awesome. And I think it's a good reminder for many of us. Well, hey, Ambrose, Joyce, thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, you know, obviously stick around in the question and answer afterwards, but just so appreciate, you know, such an early morning. So thank you for joining us. Um, with that, next, we want to take a look at a few short clips of the team and their climb. You have to pour every bit of who you are into this if you're going to make it to the top. That was the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, it was steep, but uh, it was awesome. I did not die, and so I consider it a victory. Three principles are one, you have to take enough water, walk slowly by slowly, we say pole pole, and then the third one, you have to eat as much as you can. This weather is such a gift, it's great. And that gives me goosebumps, um, you know, seeing it again. It's, uh, it actually brings back memories for me. I, uh, I climbed Kilimanjaro 15 years ago. And uh, I'll tell you, they, uh, my guide and my team, they called me crazy hair. I actually don't know why, but uh, things have changed in 15 years, that's for sure. Um, this is a photo of me on, on my way up to the top. For me, the experience, you know, the memories, just even watching that, John, you know, when you said, uh, when John stated and he said, listen, I got the top, I didn't die. <laughs> this is a victory. That sums it up. You know, I, such an unbelievable spiritual experience, you know, being on a mountain, going to the top, just what you go through, the fatigue, the grueling steps. Um, it takes so much grit and determination and resolve. So with that, you know, we had a total of six climbers. We've heard from Dale. We heard from Ambrose. Four other climbers, we had uh, Dale's, uh, Dale's son, Chad. We had Nate Slago, our videographer, which we'll hear from at the end. But with that, I want to introduce Dale and John. And Dale, I mean, he's a dear friend of mine, obviously a colleague. He's brilliant, uh, simply put. Everything at Thrive that we stand for, that we do, it represents, and it's from Dale. Um, when I met Dale, I didn't believe it, but I heard the rumors. He actually had over a thousand books on his Kindle re relating to, you know, Thrive and our methodologies and growing and agriculture and biointent. I couldn't actually imagine a better situation or dream of somebody better to work with, you know, our, as a founder. And for John, John Putnam, I've actually met John within this last year. He is a board member, um, you know, at Thrive one of the smartest, more well thought out, passionate and generous individuals I've met. Uh, to be honest, I don't, Thrive wouldn't be where we are at today without John and his wife, Jenny. So with that, I wanna invite both John and uh, Dale. And uh, I guess first question for you, and John, I'm gonna start with you. First question, what led you to climb uh, Mount Kilimanjaro? And even when did you decide that you were gonna come climb? Well, um, uh... Well, I'll, there's several things. One of them is, James, that I saw the picture of you doing it. Um, and so you inspired me. That was one thing. Um, I, I would say that the um, uh, it was sort of a last minute decision in the sense I thought I was booked and then the Lord opened a window and I was able to actually join. The reason I did it, the reason I wanted to do it is because um, Dale is my friend. 
And Dale has loved uh, Jenny and me and our family since our children were very small. And um, he's just, um, you know, been a, a wonderful person and I, to us, and I wanted to give something back to him. And the second reason is because what Dale and Linda are doing with Thrive has um, impacted so many people and they do it in a way that I really genuinely believe in. I feel like they're humble and they're thrifty and they don't throw money at the problem. Um, and they genuinely care about people who have nothing. Um, and they really want to make a difference and Thrive is a way to actually make a difference in the lives of people who um, have, have very, very little. You know, the, the porters who helped us climb to the top were people who make, you know, $5 a day. So for the, basically the price of a latte, that was their daily wages and they carried three times as much stuff as we did. So I thought um, if Dale wants me to go and I can help him and be a friend to him and support uh, his dream and do something that I believe in, then yes, I genuinely want to do it. It was not because I wanted to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. <laughs> and that's awesome because almost everybody that you talk to that has climbed it, you know, it was, I wanted the feat. I wanted the accomplishment. I wanted the bucket list, you know, whatever it is, right? Um, what an amazing story of why you did it, you know? So thanks for sharing. Um, Dale, we've heard from you a little bit. Well, I shared a little bit, you know, about why you decided to climb, but maybe you want to elaborate on that a bit, you know, and, and where this was birthed and why you decided to climb it. You know, there's probably about 10 reasons why I want to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. You can't go too many places where um, just without seeing Kilimanjaro in terms of the, the beauty of Africa. If you're going to see the beauty of, of East Africa, you're going to see Kilimanjaro. And, um, and I've known a number of people like you, Jamie, and a few other people that have done it. And I thought this would be um, just the ultimate test of saying, um, you know, how can I get up this mountain? Um, now, this was particularly amazing in which I had um, pretty much the whole team were people that I just thought this is going to be the most amazing trip to spend a week with John, to speak, spend a week with Ambrose, to spend a week with Joyce, to spend a week with my son um, and and um, and even Nate, who we've come to know and, and love through the the, uh, the whole uh, documentary making. That, that was so amazing. I've been taking teams to developing countries for 40 years. And I just knew this was going to be really special. But at the same time, I knew that this mountain was really going to kick my butt. It almost seems like the film is in slow motion when we're walking. Like, but the reality is, uh, you know, when you're walking in, uh, you know, you're walking a half a marathon a day uh, through an obstacle course where at times there's 50% of the oxygen it's pretty tough. And I knew that this would be an incredible spiritual high. I felt that, you know, uh, I felt really confident that God said, you trust me and I'll get you up this mountain. And, um, but when I seen it, I thought, oh my goodness, how in the world are we gonna do this? And so there, there, there's a whole bunch of different reasons. I think our lives are pretty easy in terms of, you know, overcoming some of the huge obstacles uh, that I would never want to pay, uh, uh, pass a lot of the tests of people I see in Africa. And so this is just five, uh, you know, six days where I had to pass the test. And, um, and I thought, I need to do this. I need to experience, uh, you know, something that's way bigger than me and, and watch um, God provide. And, and um, it was such an amazing prayer journey. But it was just this thing of spending time with these people and looking at this obstacles how in the world do we get up this thing? And um, uh, just look at the guides and everything that was going on. Awesome. And, you know, both of you guys talking about friendship and community and teamwork. And, uh, you know, I just briefly shared, you know, when I climbed, uh, I went all by myself, you know, not talking to anybody for five days other than my guide, uh, you know, it's quite challenging, but, you know, in that sense, the spiritual level of just in your head and you're just hiking and the grit. So, it's, it's incredible. Dale, I'm going to, you know, keep going with you on that is, you know, so ultimately how was the climb for you and how was the experience? Well, you know, you get up every day and like, you know, even sleeping at night when there's, you know, um, 30% or 40% or 50% oxygen, you, you can wake up in the middle of the night and you go, <gasps> and you're wondering, you know, um, can I actually breathe? And, and, uh, cause you have to focus on your breathing when you're doing this thing. And so, um, 
you know, the coolest thing, I, I, I say 60% of it was a spiritual, I felt God was kicking my butt up the mountain. And about 30% of it really was uh, the, the people that I was with. They, 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 we were so perfectly matched, so perfectly uh, a, a team together. And, you know, the other 10% was just looking at the, the challenge of it. Um, it, 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 just the beauty, the incredible beauty of it, like the beauty, of, you know, you, you don't see beauty like that because it's just rugged and raw. And, um, and so, uh, you, you draw from a reserve and a, a, a place that you just didn't know was there. Yeah, that's awesome. John, what about you? You know, ultimately, you know, how, how was the climb for you compared to your expectations and, you know, how it going and. Well, I, um, uh, I actually had done a little bit of training earlier this summer because my son and, uh, had to go hiking in the Rockies. And so I accompanied him. So I'd gotten up to like 12,000 feet and I was in relatively good shape. But in order to do that, I had to get cleared from a doctor and I actually failed my first um, cardiac exam. And uh, I had to get, you know, it go, have special, you know, tests and everything like that run. So I was a little bit actually concerned and you get to be my age and all of a sudden you think, well, things could go wrong from here. And I remember the day of the summit, I remember waking up and thinking, um, well, this could be the last day of my life. <laughs> and um, uh, which is a weird thought. I've never, I've never gotten up that way before, you know? Um, and um, so you kind of get up there and, uh, you know, you're, you're literally climbing like, uh, you know, a, a stride is the length of your boot. And you're going up sort of, you know, uh, 4,000 feet uh, with very, very short strides like that. So um, when I got to the top, uh, once you get to this, the part called Stella Peak, then actually the, the final ascent is not that bad, as you know. But um, uh, when I got to the top, I, um, I started crying, actually, because I thought I didn't die. Um, and... Uh, and that was that was for real. Uh, like I actually thought about it that morning, and it didn't happen. And I was um, just, you know, incredibly grateful. I felt cared for and grateful and nurtured and empowered. I whatever the word is, um, and um, and eventually very sore because it turns out that what's even harder than going up to the top of the mountain is coming down. And uh, the last day. I, uh, we descended 10,000 feet and I had to spend the day after that in my hotel room in bed because I couldn't walk, but, um, uh, but I didn't die. And I was, uh, extremely grateful for not dying. <laughs> and that is, uh, I, yeah, man, I hadn't heard any of that. That is unbelievable. Well, I mean, John, you know, to that extent, extending a little bit, you know, I had introduced and mentioned you're one of our board members at Thrive. Um, maybe talk about your passions, your passions and how that connects with being a part of the Thrive Board. Um, yeah. Well, I'm, um, I'm an economist by training and I actually started out in developmental economics uh, 40 years ago um, and then gradually got involved in innovation. Um, I feel like uh, what Thrive does is both innovative and a return to um, the way God intended things, you know, God gave us uh, food for healing and for medicine and for nourishment and for life. And um, uh, as much as I respect, you know, doctors and treatments and everything like that, and I think those are things are important. Um, uh, I, I there's something about the um, considering the old ways and. Uh, growing, you know, lettuce yourself, allowing God to provide for you in the simple things and actually not trying to find the better crop, you know, th the crops that are in Africa these days are actually not nutritious at all. We didn't, we didn't need to innovate new crops. We needed to actually grow the things that God gave us to eat. And um, so I, although it's, although what Thrive is doing is very innovative and it's very efficient, um, it's also very, um, uh, I don't know what the, what the word is, original. It's, it's not, it's, it's, it's closer to the way uh, we were created to be. And um, 
uh, and there's a certain kind of humility and, and yet confidence in, uh, I think, what it imparts to people, which is the ability that they can thrive literally in their own circumstances, even if they're in the middle of a, uh, a ghetto or a, a dump, they can provide for themselves and the food God gives them is enough for them and their children. And that's actually in some ways kind of a radical message that you don't hear nearly enough of. And I, it really appeals to me to be able to um, communicate that to people and uh, whether the UN recognizes it or not, or Bill Gates recognizes it or not, um, there are thousands of people who recognize it and their kids go to bed uh, with a full belly at night and their mothers have hope that they're not gonna die of malaria or some other disease. And you can't put a price on that. It's, it's much more important than anything I do on a daily basis. And so I'm extremely grateful to be able to be part of something like that. That's awesome, makes sense. I actually used to say economics. I just recently, a professor of economics at our local university, because we're here in British Columbia uh, under food rationing between eggs and milk and just it's hoarding and it's a huge problem. But he said, if you know that if you run out of milk that you can go next door, milk or eggs or some type of growth, you can go next door. And if your neighbor is willing to share some of that with you, you're then got community. You're not going to go to the store and start hoarding. And then he, you know, starts detailing the whole thing. And basically, and, and he's like, are we living in community or not? Right. It's powerful when you're in the midst of living it. And, you know, just kind of what you're you know, sharing, because it's true. Dale, passing it over to you, you know, talk a bit about your passions. Obviously, you've been at this, you know, with Amber, I mean, like, you know, a long time, 12 plus years. Talk a bit about your passions and connecting with your role of being founder. Yeah, the, the, the interesting thing for me is I've been going to developing countries for over 40 years. And, and after 25 years, I, I really didn't think that there was a lot of good, viable, sustainable options for people in developing countries. It just didn't seem to be working. And then I got turned on to organic gardening that grows you know, really nutritious, disease-fighting food and herbal medicine. And I thought, you know, I got to get back into the fray. I need to, you know, I need to do something with that. Fortunately, uh, my wife was super supportive and helped us out economically and all that kind of stuff. And so the, the interesting thing is, is that um, in many ways, um, you know, Jamie, Jamie's taken over the running of the organization. I still have a third of my life left and I can decide I can sit down and retire and retiring to me is like a one dimensional idea. It just doesn't make any sense. And this idea of spending the last third of my life climbing this big mountain of going, taking what we think is the most cost-effective way of helping the poor to many, many nations is just to me, exciting. And um, I could look at, um, you know, all kinds of obstacles like in Kilimanjaro. There were days when, you know, we thought we had some very serious obstacles, like, um, you know, your, your feet are falling apart, you can't sleep at night, um, and, uh, and it, you know, you can't breathe. And, um, and those are things that we overcame. And um, I just am very excited. I, I came back and I, I, I think I was a changed person. Like, you know, spiritually, I'm a changed person, you know, and, and um, just the sense of this last third of the, you know, the last third of my life is not going to be spent just kind of playing golf. Not that that's a bad thing to do. But, and so it's, an, you know, this opportunity, I feel like it really said, you know, the sky's the limit. You can keep going, you can keep doing this. And, um, and plus I got to experience that with, with some of my best friends. Um, and uh, my son said, you know, dad, what are, what are we gonna do next? Like, this was such a blast, what are we gonna do next? And so we gotta find another mountain somewhere. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it, it just ties into everything. It's, it's, it's identifying with people with struggles. It's saying, am I gonna keep going? Am I gonna pour everything into this? Uh, because we've seen tons of change but it's a pretty big world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, Dale, John, thank you guys both for, you know, sharing from your experience from uh, the awesome, you know, uh, thing, uh, overcoming that you did. So with that, I'm going to transition us a bit. And before we show another clip, um, you know, I, I did mention, you know, that uh, I've been with Thrive for about three years. 
And uh, what kind of introduced me to Thrive was, uh, you know, probably one of the, you know, uh, most passionate, engaged, uh, intelligent business people I've ever worked with, um, that I worked with for said seven years. He came to me and introduced me to Dale and to Thrive. And basically he summed it up this way. And he just said, listen, the best way to tackle and solve poverty is what these guys have figured out and what they're doing. You know, it's from a pure business standpoint, it has got the biggest bang for the buck, strongest ROI, and it is making such a massive difference on the basic essentials and needs of nutrition and health and food. Um, it was then that I visited Kenya. I literally, you know, spent a little three days there, came back and said, this is real. It's everything he says. Um, the projects that I got to visit and the people that I got to meet and see, I, I, I mean, I'm being honest, the healthiest people I've ever met in my life. Um, that was pretty eye opening. And, you know, so that we want to just take a look here and, uh, you know, show just a, some quick images of a clip from some of the communities that we work in and really what Ambrose and Joyce that we met are engaged with. I realized what my community was lacking, like how they can grow their own healthy food. My vision was have like a small training center and also a demo garden whereby I could be bringing people there and just train them, then they can do the same work in their communities. The, the thing with Thrive is, is that it is such a measurable uh, financial commitment to um, what we're doing. And so uh, for as little as $15 for a family, we can create uh, food and, and health security through growing your own vegetables and, and herbal medicine. And uh, so you can scale it, and you can make it much bigger. And this idea of doing 5,000 life gardens um, was a pretty, you know, bodacious sort of uh, goal. Something large like that, when we start talking about 5,000 uh, life gardens, it just kind of got me excited. Wow. So with that, over the last 18 months um, at Thrive, you know, with especially with the pandemic, we've been through lots of, you know, transitions and essentially we've converted our organization from just on only running programs in communities to where now we've built an online training platform and we've really built a lot of foundations that are stepping to put us into um, starting to scale all of our impact through partnerships. Um, we were on track for next year to run with three major partnerships, uh, something that honestly I didn't think or dream would be possible um, over the next year. Um, we're going to be working with Food for the Hungry, an organization in Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia called Gateway, and Prison Fellowship International. Um, currently, what you see here, this is just kind of an overview of our current impact stats of, you know, impacting just over, you know, just around 65,000 people. We're working in over 700 communities, um, producing you know, $1.8 million uh, US of food per month based on 38 cents a meal. So you can see the impact is, it's actually astronomical. Our goal when we when three years ago, we actually set a goal. You know, our goal was this big, hairy, audacious goal that we could impact a million people by the year 2025. And I think when you, we, we, when you start and you look at that, it, it actually looks you know, almost insurmountable, similar to Kilimanjaro and similar when you stare up to the 19,000 feet and you're just, how are we gonna get there? How is this gonna happen? But the way that everything has transitioned over the last period and the partnerships that we have, it's absolutely possible and it's absolutely gonna happen. Um, I think there's times that I wake up in the morning and I just shake myself. Like, it's amazing to think that at Thrive, you know, being a part of this team, that we can actually impact over a million people um, with health and nutrition and, um, yeah, all, all the things that we take for granted for here in the West. I think getting a little bit personal, I, my wife returned last night. She's been gone for the last month, actually, and I've been home with the three kiddos. And I, I had one opportunity to talk to her while she was away um, to really dive in and spend time together. And we spent about a half an hour talking and her, she went on a medical mission to West Africa, specifically Liberia. They did over 40 neurological surgeries. Um, yeah, she was pretty broken uh, to be honest. And, and I remember her telling me saying, Jamie, this is 
injustice. It's not, where is the justice in all of this? It's not right. It's not right that every single one of these surgeries that we did, they could have been solved. They could have been solved if they just would have had nutrition. They would have had health. They could have had access to leafy greens and plant-based and you know food and disease-fighting food. Um, she was actually quite angry. I had to call friends to actually decompress afterwards. Um, one of the surgeries that they did do was, uh, was a 14 year old boy. And I, I got to see a picture and his head was filled with so much fluid. It, his, this fluid sack on the back of his head was the size of his head. And, you know, it was coming from spina diffia. And, and this comes from a lack of folic acid from when his mom was pregnant. It is something so simple that if his mom, while pregnant, would have had access to leafy greens or asparagus and Brussels sprouts, none of that would have happened. And you think about his life and if the medical mission wouldn't have happened, you know, and what would have happened to him. And, and this is just one story of one person. Um, and, and, and it really highlighted, I think, for her and, you know, for me, it's this, the, the access to nutrition and healthy food. It's, it's just critical for life. Um, I've seen, you know, it, it firsthand the power and the impact of a life garden at, at Thrive. This is what we call it a life garden, a life garden. It, it's basically a community garden project made up of give or take about 50 garden beds, um, about, about on a quarter acre of land. It combines probably 30, maybe 40 different crop varieties with nutrition and disease fighting food. As I mentioned earlier, one of the things that attracted me so much to Thrive and Dale, Dale and John shared, and it's this element that for $15, we can actually introduce, train and empower somebody to this concept of a life garden. And you know, this is sustainable. It's just a one thing. It's not a monthly support. It's not a monthly fee, right? And so it's um it's absolutely incredible. And I think you know Linda Bolton, um you know in her experience in business, the thing she always says, what she loves about Thrive is our projects are sustainable. Uh, today, over sixty percent of our projects and communities we work in, they don't need more money um, once they grow and have access to. So with that, you know, part of being being here tonight and the campaign that we started. Uh, the, create, the unbelievable audacious goal that we set for this campaign for the whole year to raise half a million dollars um, to help fuel 5,000 life gardens, setting us into next year and impact over 200,000 people. Uh, we're nearly 85% of the way there. We still have an $80,000 uh, that, you know, $82,000 that we need to raise before now and the end of the year. Um, these funds are used to fuel the partnerships that we have. You know, so I want to invite everybody and create that opportunity to join us, be a part of this and the things that were shared tonight um, and the impact that Thrive is having. There's a couple different ways to give. Um, there's a link that you can click in in the chat box that you can click on and instantly give. You can click on the QR code and scan it in. Um, take a copy of the, the, you know, the, the, the link as well if you want to give at a later date. Um, so yeah, with that, just really want to encourage you, be a part of this. And, and just even what I mentioned, you know, even what I've been through the last month, as I mentioned with my wife and just can change lives, just nutrition and health and, uh, what I know that Thrive is doing. So thank you for considering this opportunity to, you know, partner with us and thank you for, uh, joining us with this. So before we close, we do want to, uh, you know, have one last conversation with Nate, our documentarist. Um, we'll also watch a closing film here. We want to end, uh, you know, watching this film. It's a short clip of just some of the scenery um, that goes around uh, the scenery of Kilimanjaro, and then from there, uh, we'll uh, bring in Nate and talk to him.
that's awesome. Just the power and sheer brilliance of challenge of everything. Um, so with that, I want to welcome Nate. Um, first of all, Nate, thank you so much for all that you have done. I remember that uh, when you and I first met, and I remember talking about what in the world it was going to be like lugging up all of this filming gear to the top of this mountain <laughs> and how that was going to even be possible. Um, so yeah, with that, Nate, um, you know, it, yeah, are you, let's see. I believe I'm unmuted. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> sure connected. Nice to see everyone again from the climb. Uh, yeah, as far as climbing it, I think, uh, you know, it was a difficult thing to prepare for because you don't really know what you're up against. There's a lot of things that can go wrong, whether it's weather or, you know, health things or team morale. Um, but I think with our team, and I think everyone's mentioned this so far, is like, we just had a great team. Everyone was positive. I think even when people were complaining, they were doing it in a positive way. There was never, I don't think there was ever, like everyone had their negative moments and stuff and their times where they were kind of, you know, fight, like having an inner fight. But I think everyone kept each other going and that had a big part to play in it as well as we just got super lucky with weather. It was beautiful out there. It was obviously, it got cold at night, but it was sunny all day and it was really nice. That is awesome. Um, Nate, is there anything as far as filming 19,000 feet up on top of the world, largest freestanding mountain? You probably never thought you'd do that. What was it like filming a documentary on the top of Kilimanjaro? Well, the toughest thing honestly was figuring out how to power a camera for seven days. Uh, there's lots of different ways that you can do it, um, but that was a challenge. And uh, my solution was just a bag full of batteries. Uh, luckily, I didn't have any issues at the airport bringing all those batteries uh, through. So, uh, but yeah, again, like it was sunny, it was beautiful. It wasn't too cold. The camera didn't have any issues with that. I personally didn't have any issues. So yeah, like, I don't know, maybe I just got lucky or maybe I was prepared well, I don't know. But yeah, yeah it all worked out. Nate, you've also filmed for CBC, for you know the Americans joining us, that's Canadian Broadcasting Corp, it's uh, big. <laughs> anyway, so you filmed for CBC and you did a documentary. You were 90 feet under the water from what I understand. And now you've done one, you know, 19,000 feet. What's the difference? The difference, uh, well, shooting underwater, it's, you're dealing with crazy atmospheric pressure and getting a camera to operate at those uh, depths can be difficult for sure. Whereas this was more of a personal challenge, I'd say, uh, just seeing if I could do it. You know, there was always the thought that I could get altitude sickness and what would the documentary look like if I wasn't able to summit? Uh, those thoughts so, yeah. never crossed my brain, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Um, yeah, and I think that's the thing is like it's with a lot of things like this is I was getting anxiety leading up to it. Uh, you know, I feel like I'm a worrier beforehand, but once you're in it, you just kind of have to make it work. Uh, luckily, there wasn't any situations where like I was struggling very hard or anything. So, yeah, it was great. I really enjoyed it. This was honestly, this was like a dream, like a trip of a lifetime. And to do it with these people that are now my friends is great. Yeah, Nate, that's awesome. I, you know, now that you've been through all of this and you're working on the documentary and you've climbed, summited, and you've been to Katale, you know, kind of the base of where our projects and programs and all that, what are your hopes and what do you hope that this documentary accomplishes? Yeah, no, I hope, my, my first hope is I, I hope people see it. I hope people watch it and I hope it resonates with people. I think, uh, what you guys are doing or what Thrive is doing in Africa is really important. And from visiting Katale after Kilimanjaro and seeing the work that everyone's putting in, seeing what Ambrose is doing, seeing what Joyce is doing, seeing what the entire team there, they're just like so passionate about what they do. And it is a model that actually works. So if, if my work can bring awareness towards that, then that's a success in my eyes. 
I agree with you, you know, and to be honest with you, mate, I feel the same thing. It's like, I, I wish I could get to the top of the mountain with a megaphone, you know, and just kind of, you know, uh, pronounce as far as like what is happening and works and especially in the light of a pandemic. I mean, I read, you know, about, you know, what's happening in British Columbia and like food shortages, right? And, you know, just how much it can change lives um, having access. So, you know, the more awareness that we can create and really that was the vision behind, you know, some of, you know, the documentary and behind this is creating awareness, right? For sure. About what's happening. So it's so good, you know, hearing your firsthand experience from visiting and being there and seeing it. Um, it's great. So Nate, thank you for everything and just the work that you're doing on this. And yeah, it's great that you had such a good experience. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Well, with that, everybody, we're actually wrapping up. That's kind of the end of our program. Um, I just honestly, thank you so much for taking the time out of your evening. Um, for all of our panelists, um, John, on that, you know, the, the, the evening of a Thanksgiving in America, thank you, you know, Dale and Joyce, Ambrose, thank you so much for joining us all the way from Kenya in the early morning. Um, and also, thank you, everybody, for just your support, your generosity, being part of the journey. I think we all know that uh, none of this happens and none of it's possible, you know, the impact and transformation. It's not possible, um, you know, without, you know, everybody part of the team and the partnership and just the generosity of those involved. So thank you.